To Senior Voice. I'm Bernie Simmons filling in for Pauline Martin who was on a trip today. She cannot be here of course uh, but we're dealing with the topic of senior caregivers and today we have with us Diane Fontana. She's care manager for Connecticut Community Cares Incorporated. The a lot of us are finding that uh, that today we have, uh, we're in a position where we are now looking after our parents. There are certain things they cannot do, some of them very simple, like now they can't paint the back doorsteps, they can't break their yard, or they may be at a point where they can't live alone because of uh, different maladies. Um, is this something where you would go in and evaluate and do something like that? Yes, absolutely. That's the main focus of what we do at Connecticut Community Care. We're an access agency nonprofit, and we contract with the state of Connecticut for the Connecticut Home Care Program for Elders. So if someone is found to have certain functional needs and meet certain financial requirements, the family or the elder, him or herself, can make a referral to the state of Connecticut. And then that referral, depending on region, comes to our office or it goes to one of the other access agencies, uh, typically an area agency on aging in a particular geographic location in the state of Connecticut. Now, are you uh, a part of uh, the, the Connecticut health system or... The, uh, are you a separate agency working for the state of Connecticut? We're a separate agency. We're okay. a contracted provider with the state of Connecticut. We provide the case management services for the home care program mm -hmm. for elders, also for the Money Follows the Person program for those individuals who are currently in a nursing home and may be able to come home and live on their own again. So after your evaluation, you recommend uh, that certain things happen or uh, certain types of care is given and uh, the family follows up or do you follow up? We follow up. We like to work very much mm -hmm. collegiately with the elder and with the family members to mm -hmm. determine what's best for the particular individual. Um, we always let the family know that these formal services are supportive of what the family currently is able to do for the family member or it could be a friend or a neighbor. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we find people with no family in the area. And so we together um, come up with a care plan and the services that are needed. Yeah. And it's a needs-based program. So if someone needs help with bathing, for example, that would be a home health aid service. We also can provide homemaker, companion, adult day center, meals on wheels, uh, nursing visits. So we identify the need and then to that we attach a service, always in collaboration, especially with the elder, him or herself. We're very much involved in person-centered planning. So we want to enlist that person's cooperation and aid in determining the care plan so that they're happy and comfortable with what's happening in their lives. Uh, you sort of mentioned that there's different levels of care. Um, would you recommend that uh, we, people get involved with uh, your agency before things are serious? Or can Absolutely. it be a very simple thing like uh, perhaps care of the home? Absolutely. And we find many folks who start out with a minimal plan of care. 
Um, we always try to focus on the fact that we want to emphasize what people are still able to do mm -hmm. independently and provide the supportive services as needed so that that individual can continue to enjoy those things mm -hmm. that they can still do on their own yeah. by receiving those supportive services with things that they may be having a little trouble with. And um, before we get into the financial aspect of this, um, how much care can, you, can they give uh, I'm thinking in terms of uh, someone who needs to get help with bathing and, and uh, exercise or uh, cooking meals. I'm thinking of that commercial where the, the lady is, uh, uh, the person comes in and starts a, a pot of soup and, mm -hmm. the, and the lady is looking around until she moves and then she puts a little more <laughs> stuff in the, in the pot. Absolutely, and we yeah. encourage that. That's uh -huh. a wonderful example yeah. of what we encourage, that it's, again, collegiate and working with people, not having them feel that they're minimized in any way. So to get them involved in their own care as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that it's, sounds it's great. It's very critical. Because it, uh, if they're involved in their own care, you know they'll be participating and and not only that, but continuing on after the person leaves. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, speaking of that, uh, now the, how long can this person stay? Uh, is it an hour, three hours, uh, a day? Uh, Again, under the home care program for elders, it's a needs-based program. Mm -hmm. So we determine the need and then, again, we attach the service, and as professionals, as case managers, we're able to determine what the duration of the mm -hmm. service would be. Um, for example, someone who lives in a typical elder apartment, mm -hmm. perhaps one bedroom, two bedrooms, living room, kitchen, mm -hmm. um, if someone needed homemaker service to help with laundry and housework, and so forth, but perhaps also needed somebody to assist with shopping, taking them to the grocery store. I would typically um, authorize about three hours twice a week. So one day is spent in the home, taking care of the laundry and the housework and so forth. And the other day perhaps would be spent doing errands to the grocery store to allow time to get there, do the shopping. So again, the elder is involved, mm -hmm. not just sending someone do the shopping for me. Um, that way they come home, they put away the groceries together, and um, that works out really well. That would certainly help with the resistance. Some elderly people feel that they don't need this help, that you're insinuating that they're getting feeble or they're, uh, they're not capable of handling their own affairs. Absolutely, and again, the focus always is on mm -hmm. what people's abilities are and to promote independence in those abilities, not to dwell on things that are becoming mm -hmm. difficult. Now, I'd like to go into a little bit on the financing of this because everyone mm -hmm. is afraid of they're gonna run out of money or this is gonna be very expensive or um, I, uh, how, how uh, can arrangements be made for financing, uh, if they don't have insurance, if they have limited savings and things like that? Mm -hmm. There are several ways to go about it. Typically, people would pay privately first mm -hmm. off if they have the assets and they have the income that allows them to do that. We have a private care management associates mm -hmm. department at Connecticut Community Care, and they can provide case management states in the United States mm -hmm. that still provides a state-funded program. For that program, there is a cost share. It's a, mm -hmm. like a copay yeah, yeah. for anything mm -hmm. else that you would receive. And there are certain asset and, and so forth limits for couples and for individuals. Mm -hmm. um, for an individual, it's about 35,000 in assets. Mm -hmm. And for a couple, it's about 42 or 43. Those change uh, periodically. Uh, yeah. So it's, that's not really important is the exact amount. Mm -hmm. Then there are folks who have basically very no yeah, assets, yeah, yeah. Um, and that would be a Title 19 or a Medicaid application, yeah. and that person would be able to have $1,600 mm -hmm. in assets total, and there is an income limit of $2,130 per month. But there are ways, if people have an yeah. income over that amount, working through an elder care attorney and their trust that can be set up, mm -hmm. special needs trust, so that some of that income can be diverted in order mm -hmm. to allow that elder to be approved yeah. as a Title 19 
uh, candidate. Mm -hmm. And as the funding increases, the federal funded program, the care plan amount, the dollar mm -hmm. for the budget increases. I see. So. It's beginning to sound a little complicated. It's very is it, complicated, yeah, yes. Is it, uh, <laughs> is it something they can handle without a lawyer, or would they have to? Or If it's a pooled trust, you mm -hmm. do need an attorney yeah. to help with okay. that. But any of these other things, um, we, on a daily basis, as mm -hmm. care managers, complete those Title 19 applications. Your town, Department of Elder Services, has social workers right. who can assist. If people are involved with a skilled nursing agency, they have social workers yeah. who can assist. And I always tell people the best place to start with any kind of planning is with your yeah. primary care physician. Yeah. And that person can direct you. Yeah. That was going to lead into my next question. Mm -hmm. Where where does the doctor come in? Does does he have to recommend uh, your services, uh, the person to their your services, or can mm -hmm. it go the can you recommend they go to their doctor or how, how would that uh, it actually works both ways. Yeah. Um, we have physicians who will have an elder come in and they see a change mm -hmm. and think that there might be a reason mm -hmm. for that person to have some assistance. And they have the number for the state of Connecticut mm -hmm. and they can call and make that referral. Um, and that's mm -hmm. and then it goes through that process that mm -hmm. I explained earlier. Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. um, would probate court be involved at any time or with, for a conservator or? Yes, and probate court really becomes sort of the last place to go. Yeah. Um, probate court determines whether a person is capable or mm -hmm. not. Yeah. They determine capacity of that person to make decisions that a quote unquote normal average yeah. person would make. Now these don't have to be decisions that we approve of. Yeah. These are just decisions that a normal person would be able to make. Mm -hmm. If a person is determined to have capacity, no conservator will be appointed. Yeah. Okay. Um, two things I'd like to talk to you about. Firstly, uh, what, uh, what association would you have with our Caring Connection? We have um, in Windsor um, a group who um, will accept um, elderly pa patients, I shouldn't say patients, but clients, mm -hmm. and um, they can go there for the day and participate in uh, social activities and, and uh, other uh, interesting things like art and music and things like that and of course have a social meal and um, is that something that your group would recommend uh, if uh, the person like qualified for it or or you wanted to get them out of the house? Absolutely and adult day centers and let me clarify yeah. it, it really should be determined as an adult day center. Uh, okay. The term adult day care if you were the elder, or I know uh, if I were the elder and I were told I was going to daycare, daycare. I would put on the brakes yeah. right away. <laughs> so we really try to encourage yeah. them that it's an adult day center. Yeah. They're wonderful programs, um, as well as being a care manager for CCCI. And mm -hmm. really the reason I'm a care manager yeah. at CCCI is I was a caregiver for my dad oh, okay. who had dementia yeah. for several years. Um, and I cared for him in my home and he had CCCI mm -hmm. services and he did go to a day center. It really gives that person mm -hmm. a sense of purpose, yeah. um, a schedule to arise in the morning, to come down and have breakfast, socialize with the family. Mm -hmm. The van comes to pick the individual up and off they go to the center for the yeah. day. Oftentimes the center will enlist the aid of the elders mm -hmm. to make them feel that they're helping, which is yeah. really what people want to do. They want to have that sense of still contributing yeah. and helping. And it's just a wonderful atmosphere. It provides that wonderful service for the individual. Mm -hmm. And the other part that's really wonderful is for the caregiver at home, it provides a time of respite. None of us were born in this life, whether we're daughters or sons or daughters-in-law yeah. or husbands, wives or whatever, to be with an yeah. individual 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This is not something that really yeah. is a good situation for any, for, for any kind of a relationship. Either of the individuals. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it allows a separation. Mm -hmm. Each person goes about their business of the day. Yeah. And then when they return in the afternoon, it becomes more like the old routine when the family would come yeah. home and gather and so forth. So it really is very uplifting and it really does help um, to 
stave off feelings of depression or anxiety or worry because people, again, are occupied right. and they have that feeling of purpose. It's a wonderful, wonderful service and the Caring Connection is a wonderful program. We do refer clients to the Caring Connection oh, through the home great. care program. Yeah. And of course they have something to talk about with their family members over supper or dinner or whatever they have at night. And, exactly. Uh, and there's something for them to do. Mm -hmm. And at the center they have the opportunity too with having individuals with whom to share their experiences at home. Yeah. What elder doesn't want to speak about his or her family, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren in many yeah. cases, um, trips that they've taken, photos that they've received. So it really is just a wonderful opportunity all the way around. Now, what do you guys do when the person resists? If you ever mention to a senior that he's going to not be in total control of his life, they resist. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any magical potion that they... <laughs> Gosh, I wish I did. <laughs> a wand that you wave to get them to... I actually to do, do have that. a magic wand at my oh, office. Oh, great. <laughs> it's my little prop. Um, again, when we talk about person-centeredness, mm -hmm. we talk about engagement of the individual. Mm -hmm. We talk about open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. We talk about not being authoritative and directorial. Once we mm -hmm. engage an individual in... What do you think? Would it be okay mm -hmm. if, if you did this, it would really help me out? Yeah. Those kinds of questions, those kinds of conversations really are much more productive than to say, for example, with my father, you know what, Daddy, you have dementia now and you mm -hmm. can't stay here all day, mm -hmm. so you're going to adult daycare. Yeah, that's, That would automatically yeah. be a resistive. Yeah. Here's the, the correct that's conversation. It. You know what, Daddy? There's this really great center. I know some folks yeah. over there. They need some help, and they really would love for you to come. Would it be okay if we went over and had a visit? I really think you'd enjoy mm -hmm. it. So you can yeah. see the difference in the messaging, and that's what's really oh, important. Yeah. Okay. It's for yeah. people to still believe they're in control. Uh, yeah. That's I the, know I'm very yeah. independent, and I don't want anyone to take my independence from me. Therefore, I would never, never... Yeah want to take but, anybody's independence yeah. or give them that feeling that they weren't worthy to be independent. Excuse me, Diane, we've got to go to a commercial break right now. Welcome back to Senior Voice. I'm Gunter David, and I have a few questions for Diane. Okay, Diane, you were talking about people who would be going to a center, but they are for the day. Mm -hmm. But there are, I'm sure, quite a lot of people who would rather stay home. That's correct. What, and who have caregivers, such as husbands taking care of wives, wives caregivers of husbands. What is it that you can say to the caregiver so that they can alleviate the stress of how things have changed? It's a very difficult situation. I just want to verify and confirm that that it's a very difficult situation and a change in dynamic from a relationship that began in many cases 50 or 60 years ago. So the things that a couple might have done previously together are no longer possible because of the limitations of the person who requires care now. My recommendation for the caregiver is picture yourself in the airplane as you're going up and the stewardess comes on in front and says, put your oxygen mask on. Children and people who require care first. Only put yourself in the seat of the person who requires care because you as a caregiver requires care as well. 
and oftentimes we caregivers forget that. Without that oxygen mask, you're not capable, no one would be capable of providing 24 hour a day care, seven days a week for a loved one. I always say for a caregiver, and I've been there, and I understand, and it's difficult. We as caregivers inherently have the personality where we're giving people and we put ourselves last. However, we need to put ourselves first at least for 15 minutes each day. Carve out 15 minutes and go to a place where you can just be you. I can't tell you where that place would be because it's special and it's individual for each person. But take that 15 minutes a day. Without it, you cannot survive. Additionally, family and friends oftentimes will say, if you need any help, just call me. Have you had that experience? Yes. However, people don't understand that they need to be specific in that offer of care. And there's a way to offer that type of care. For example, Diane, I would really love to spend a few hours with your dad this afternoon. Why don't you go out and do some shopping? Or just go and have your nails done. Do something you'd like to do so I can spend time alone with your dad. That makes it much easier as the caregiver to accept that offer and to know that this person wants to have some meaningful time with the person for whom care is required. So that the caregiver then going to do his or her own activity can truly enjoy that activity for him or herself. Well, that, that makes good sense. Um, is there anything you can suggest though to the caregiver when they start to think on a long range basis how is this going to keep going? I think... You know, against depression or anxiety about the future. Of course. And I think one day at a time is a really good way to look at life at that right. point. Mm -hmm. Again, I know I've been there. If one looks too far into the future, it does become so overwhelming, it's like a tidal wave and one just feels that one cannot put another foot in front of the other. So the one day at a time, knowing I can do this today, and what happens tomorrow, I'm going to be able to meet that challenge as well. Again, ask for help. Please ask for help as caregivers. I spent much too much time wanting to be in charge and wanting to take care of the whole thing on my own because I felt I might be a failure if I didn't do that otherwise. But I learned very quickly that people were very sincere and friends and family, neighbors, it's amazing who will be willing to help. Also, if you don't have the informal supports, we did talk about the formal supports that are available and helpful with um, provider agencies with homemakers and companions and personal care assistants, possibly home health aides, right. um, day centers and so forth that are available as well. Okay, well, I, that sounds good. Um, what do you do about when you have guilt feelings, when the caregiver has guilt feelings, when they do something for themselves, which involves perhaps leaving the home to have lunch with a friend mm -hmm. and leaving the person you care for with just a chain for emergency. Mm -hmm. And then while you're away with your friend for maybe an hour or two, you wonder what's happening to, to your loved one that you've left at home. Mm -hmm. I believe you're referring to a lifeline button when you talk about yes, the chain. Correct. It's an emergency response system, yes. just for clarification. Right. And it's provided to the individual. So if there is an emergency, they just press the button correct. and it goes to a call center where people are alerted and emergency assistance is mobilized right. immediately. Okay. So what can you tell the caregiver who feels guilty that they took time out? Again, none of us 
were put on this earth to spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year mm -hmm. with his or her loved ones. It's not normal. It's not the normal way that we live. So understandably, there's concern if your loved one requires care. If you're feeling guilty or uncomfortable just with the lifeline system, perhaps the caregiver might consider a bit higher level of care in, again, enlisting a friend to spend time with that individual or to provide the formal service of perhaps a companion or whatever is the appropriate level of care so that that person is also having an interesting and enjoyable time rather than just sitting and waiting for someone to come home. So you can go to lunch knowing that the loved one is having an enjoyable time on his or her own as well. Well, that sounds really good. Well, it was nice meeting you, Diane. And Thank now, you. back to a commercial break. And welcome back from our commercial break. We'll continue with our program. Oh, yes. To what extent do you, let's say you go in uh, to uh, help a, an elderly person, does that caregiver get involved in house cleaning or um, meals preparation or uh, um, anything like that? Yes, they do. Here's the really good news, something that's happened over the past mm -hmm. couple of years that wasn't available when my folks were at home. Now, under Connecticut Home Care Program, if someone is either money follows the person out of the mm -hmm. nursing home yeah. or they're eligible for the federal funding, the Medicaid funding, we can, under this program, provide care 24 hours a day, seven mm -hmm. days a week oh. with what we call a personal care assistant. That's sort of all the caregivers rolled into yeah. one. Yeah. It's a person who can help with personal care. It's a person who can help with homemaking, who can help with companion, all those things that need to be done. And that person can actually live in the individual's mm -hmm. home. Uh, there are some parameters there. There has to be a private space available for yeah. them, et cetera. But it's basically similar yeah. to a family member who is there all the time with that individual. Something new and exciting that's coming forward with the mm -hmm. state of Connecticut is the looking into a foster, an elder foster yeah. program where individuals would interview and would be working through a particular agency, a fiduciary agency, mm -hmm. to, just like people foster children, foster yeah. an elder in their home, which is really wonderful, yeah. really wonderful service. And I suppose all of this would be available to an elder person who's living in uh, elder housing? Yes, and yes, yes. The live-in personal care assistant it, that, again, it has to be mm -hmm. assessed on an individual basis and based on the housing authority's parameters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is the, now, is there any advantage to, um, sort of a leading question, to uh, using your agency to um, uh, employ a person to provide care or to go out and find somebody on your own? Well, if you're going to be associated with the Connecticut Home Care yeah. Program for Elders or the MFP, Money Follows the Person yeah. programs, then you would have to be willing to work with the contracted providers to the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we have several of those, and of course, they're, they provide yeah. different types of services. Some provide skilled services, which is nursing, home health mm -hmm. aid, and social services, homemaker, companion, um, et cetera. Some are just social service agencies and just provide that homemaker companion type level. Um, now, what kind of uh, training do your, fo your folks have who go out and, and help the elderly? Uh, are they given certification uh, programs or um, are they, how are they hired? 
each provider has a protocol mm -hmm. for hiring. I can tell you each person has a background check, which is very important. Yes, yes. That's and true. we always try to match the caregiver mm -hmm. with the individual mm -hmm. as much as we can, though we're non-discriminatory, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have many agencies that provide folks who specialize in dementia mm -hmm. care yeah, because yeah. that's something, again, that's becoming more and more prevalent yeah. with our elders in this day and age. So we can work with whatever agency. Everyone mm. has to have some type of training. Um, I couldn't be hired without having some sort of training mm -hmm. and without meeting the certain requirements that the providers mm -hmm. have to certify yeah. that they have in order to be contracted with the state of Connecticut. So people can feel very comfortable if they go okay. through the program, if they're yeah, going they're... through a contracted provider, yeah. that the um, services are adequate. And sometimes there's a personality mm -hmm. situation or something just doesn't work quite right. And yeah. we as care managers and the agencies are always working yeah, again sure. for the individual's behalf to make sure that it's a very compatible yeah. situation and the individual is very happy with what's happening. And needless to say, they all have first aid care, first aid training, and uh, first responder training and things like that. Yes, yeah. typically they so do. They, they now, know what to do in an emergency. I yes, guess, exactly. Yeah. Someone in the social service level, basically their mm -hmm. direction and their protocol is if they see something happening, they report to the office immediately, and then oh, they're directed. Okay. Typically it would be a 911 yeah. call because they're yeah. not going to take any chances with someone's health and well-being. Yeah. Oh, great, mm -hmm. great. Well, I would say that with all your responsibilities, nobody's going to be running to get your job <laughs> no. in the near future. <laughs> Actually, I have to say, yeah. I absolutely love no. what I do. It's not like a job. It really yeah. isn't. Um, my individuals provide me much more yeah. than I feel I could ever provide them. Yeah. Their wisdom and their life stories, yeah. um, just the genuine feelings um, are just so wonderful. It really isn't like getting up and going to work in the morning. And really, I believe to be a care manager, you yeah. have to feel that way. And that's a focus of Connecticut Community Care, is to really be focused on individuals and really love what you do. Well, it's really great to, to know that there is someone out there who can <laughs> give uh, uh, so many of our um, seniors a, a real good life experience at the end of their long journey. Absolutely. And it's um, a, a comfort to those of us who are getting there to uh, know that, uh, that we could take care of that in our own planning if we wished. And uh, so that when we come to that point, we would, uh, we would have you uh, Absolutely. Respond to our, our kids looking after us. There yeah. you go. <laughs> the thing that's very important, too, is though I represent the funded mm -hmm. programs yeah. and, again, long-term care insurance, that if people do have assets and they do have they, income that allows they, them to pay privately for these services, those services uh, are available. If they need case management, again, we have that private service, Care Management Associates, and they can make a phone call to that um, division of our company, mm -hmm. and they can provide that service for them as well. Well, when we have the, uh, at the end of the program, we will... Uh, put up your name and your phone number and your address Perfect. so they will all know how to get in touch with you. Absolutely. And thank you very much for coming and talking with us today. That's been very informative. And um, thank you for looking in on Senior Voice. We will be contacting you again with one of our programs concerning our Windsor citizens. Thank you. Mm -hmm.